morning, y'all. Oh, hey, King's Church family, if you're out in the lobby, we're getting going too in here. Y'all that made it through, woohoo! It's awesome. I'm so excited. It's so funny because we always talk about like who's going to kick us off this morning because we're so laid back that it's like those of us that are here, we're like ready to go. And then like the other two thirds show up. <laughs> and so it's like, all right, let's get going. And then we'll do announcements in a little bit. But I did want to let you guys know that um, there's a photo booth area out there. So we need to picture y'all. And Jackie, we need to do you and Bill, and my family hasn't been done. We need to do y'all before you guys leave. Anyway, don't take off. I want some of the pictures. I've been having my daughter do them because I want to do something with them later. So um, (laughs) I don't know about you guys. Every Easter hits me differently. Some Easters, I wake up and it's just like this joy, you know, like joy of the Lord. And it's this, and this week has been a wee bit of a weird week for me, to be perfectly honest. It was a hard week. And I have a friend who writes for the Francis Asbury Society. And I want to read to you her post this morning because I was like, yeah, that's where I am. And I don't know if any of you guys are here at the same place with me this morning, but this is what, what my friend wrote. In the early morning hours, Mary wept in the garden, wondering where Jesus was. He was near to her broken heart. He spoke her name, reached out his hand, his eyes, and her eyes were opened. Jesus sent Mary to be the first evangelist of his resurrection to the other disciples. She had seen and experienced the risen Lord, and she could not keep that good news to herself. Have you experienced his calling your name? Have you sensed his nearness in the midst of your grief? Now it is our turn to go and share the good news. He is risen, just as he said. And because he lives, we have resurrection power and love flowing through our veins. I read that this morning because I know without a doubt that there are those in our church family, in our community, and even in the greater world community that are experiencing that mix of joy and grief this morning. Grief for the world being not as it should be. And joy being the fact that he rose just as he said he did. And that human condition of that little bit of that battle that's going on there. And I just want to invite us all to come this morning. In a sense, coming to the cross and just worshiping him and giving back to him what is already his. My grief is his. My joy is his. The word says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. We don't manufacture it. It's a gift that he gives us. So this morning as we get going, I just want to pray over us as we step into worship that the joy of the Lord would be our strength. His joy overflowed. Lord, we thank you this morning. We thank you that we each come in carrying a different story. We each come in carrying different highs and lows, joys and grief, but they're all yours. Whether or not we have formally given it to you, you are the king of our lives. Whether we acknowledge you yet, you are still the king of our lives. One day, every knee will bow and every tongue will say, you are the king of kings. Blessed be your name, Lord. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. Would you open our eyes this morning? Would you open our hearts this morning? May we encounter the living and risen king, the king of glory. We love you. Amen. with us today. We're going to lift the name of the Lord. This is an older song, but I hope one that everybody remembers. Lord, I lift your name on high. And Lord, I love to sing your praises. I am so glad that you are in my life. And I'm so glad you came to save us. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing. Lord, I love to sing. So glad you're in my life. I hear y'all, that's good. I'm so glad you came to save. I'm so glad you came to save. Say, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm 
sing that verse again. Lord, I lift your name on. Sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name. Come on and lift him. Say, Lord, I lift your name. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad I'm so glad you came to save us. 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 You came from heaven to earth. You came from heaven to earth to show. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on. You came from heaven to earth, you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my dead to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name.
Amen. Amen. Y'all, don't we love watching the kids worship with us? It's such a special thing. We're doing this morning just a little bit different. I probably should have given you a heads up on that. We're going to go ahead and release our kids to Children's Church. Heads up, there is basically birth through kindergarten that happens every Sunday. Um, from the very beginning of the service, check-in is available. So if you have a little one you want to take them back, go for it. The first grade, first through fifth grade is going out now. We actually have two classes today, two classes. First and second graders will be in one class with Stephanie and Thomas over here. And then we'll have another class with Jay and Bill for the third to fifth graders. So I'll let them separate all that out. Look at those kids. Aren't they beautiful? Yeah, praise Jesus. Thank you, Father, for a generation of world changers for you. Kids that are going to learn to lay their life down before you, Father, and that you would raise them up. All right, y'all, let's keep worshiping and let them go on out and keep worshiping. The Church of Christ was born. The Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. And the church of Christ was born. Then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel. And the church of Christ, and the church of Christ was born. Then the Spirit lit now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and to his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Sing in the church of Christ was born. In the church of Christ was born. The Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. And the church of Christ was born. And the church of Christ was born. The Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. His thorn-scarred brow, his 
shame on the cross to the lamb who was slain as atonement for us to the son who overcame all the power of death we praise for the stripes for the of your We all cry out, you are worthy, God. You are worthy, God. And we crown you. We fall face down and we worship. We all cry out, you are worthy. Makes 
so we ground you we fall face down and we worship we all cry out you are The veil tore before you 
nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Wow. Thanks, you guys. Man, that was a, an amazing mix this morning. An amazing mix. Thank you all. I was here Thursday, Friday. We were here Friday. Y'all practiced Friday instead of Thursday. That's why y'all showed up and I was all weirded out. I just realized it. Okay. All right. I'm on. I'm on. So Friday, we have staff meetings on Friday. And I was up here, we were up here, staff was up here, let me put it this way. Um, Jackie and Bill and Jessica put 37 bags of mulch on that little peninsula thing that's out there. Y'all, that thing is way bigger than you think it is. 37 bags of mulch. I was in awe and like did some flour, just some like freshening up for spring to get us through summer. Kind of that like push through. Uh, Kentucky, I think is so weird to me because when I moved here, I'd never been anywhere here like this. In the fall and winter, everything dies. It dies back. And then it's like this slow getting going. But if you don't take care of stuff in the spring by about, you know, July 10th, we live in a rainforest. And it just like, there, it's almost like you have kudzu in the south. Like there's just everything everywhere. And the weeds are like, you can't go backwards. It's like, if you don't stay on top of it, there's just no getting over it. So people were here and it was amazing. But I was out in the lobby working 
And I could hear them practicing in here, and it was so beautiful. It was just so beautiful. So thank you guys so much. Welcome to the King's Church. I'm Meg. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, and I'm excited that y'all are with us today on Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. Um, it's just such a beautiful thing to have you here with us. Hopefully when you came in, you were given a couple things. One of those would be a um, Connect card if you're a first-time guest with us. If you didn't get a Connect card, there's going to be a piece here somewhere, da, 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 da. a QR code, maybe. It's okay. It's a really pretty background graphic. I like it. It feels like color and happy colors to me. Anyway, and so oh, there we go. There's the connect card. And that will take you to a place where you just can put in your name and put in some information. Um, and so I can follow up with you or one of us will this week just to pray for you and just see how you're doing, um, not to stalk you or, you know, make you commit to anything, just so that we can just say, hey, we're praying for you this morning. If you were here, we want to do that. It's an honor for us to do that. Um, if you guys have not put your birth birthday in the system and you don't know if you have or not, it would be really a great thing if every single person here would do a connect card like this and give me your birthdays. Here's why. I don't need your year if you don't want to send me your year. But once a month, we do family feast, which is, let me see if y'all pay attention. When is family feast? Awesome. Next month, yes, which is also next Sunday. Hopefully, you, you may have had one of these in a seat around you. If you flop down on a seat where there wasn't one, there should be one next to you. These are for you guys. It's some upcoming events. Helps us just to get it all out there. We try to do it in various modes at different times, so we tried this this week. Um, next week is Family Feast. On Family Feast Day, we try to celebrate birthdays. We're trying to get back into it. We were really good at it, and then Meg kind of dropped the ball for like a year. And... Um, so we're like, we're going to get back into it because next Sunday we have a really important birthday in the house. And so um, we want to celebrate Sasha's birthday as well as <laughs> it is on Sunday of next week. So we want to sing happy birthday to Sasha and everybody else that's having birthdays next month. Okay. So we're just, I, I would be helpful to me if I knew your birthday so we could stick it into the system and then it'll tell me in Otherwise, if you get offended that Meg didn't mention your birthday when she mentioned Sasha's birthday, it might be that <laughs> I don't know it. I don't want to leave y'all out. I have like FOMO backwards. I don't know if you guys deal with that. I really do. I always feel so much worried about other people than myself. I've had, I've been known to like pair my friends up, be like, y'all would make really good friends. And then I like back out and they're like, what are you doing? And I was like, well, I, I just want you guys to get to know each other. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm blathering. All right, so you, some of you guys may have wondered why there were so many cars in the parking lot when we got here this morning. Here's the thing, Hope Church, which is our, our friends that are the Ukrainian church plant, they wanted to do a sunrise service this morning. Um, their, their sunrise service was maybe a little longer than our sunrise services might have been because they really love to worship God and they have a, a formal um, choir and they were doing some other things. So they started at eight this morning. They'll be getting out about 11, but that's why you saw so many. It was just a special one-off service that they were doing. So when you're out there, just smile, greet, say hello. It's awesome to get to bump into some really friendly people from around the world in our midst, right? So, but that's why there were so many cars. That won't always be a regular thing on a Sunday morning, but praise Jesus, they had a lot more people come than they thought they were going to have as well. So that's a good thing for them and for us. All right. Family Feast is next week. Also, just the other events that are on the flyers, you can kind of go over that. We're going to be doing a few more things. I'm not going to say it all out loud right now, but we'll be talking about it upcoming. KC 101 and some other stuff. That's just to get Brad and I to know us a little better and the culture of King's Church, who we are, why we're crazy, you know. Things like that. I really think that's it, Bradley. I wanted to do something a little fun this morning. Brad was supposed to write it on here for me to remind me. It's not there. You forgot to? Okay, I'm glad I didn't forget as soon as I looked over at you. While Brad is getting the table and setting up, we have an idea. Um, those of y'all that are extroverts are going to love it. Those of you who are introverts are going to slightly die inside. <laughs> Are you excited? Ready? I know. So here's what we're going to do. What, it, what is, did we decide on what is your favorite Easter food? Yeah. What is, what is your favorite Easter food? So you, can you just turn, introduce yourself to someone and tell them what is your favorite Easter food? All right. Not a big deal. Brad's going to grab his table and you can move around. There's more donuts in the back, food, coffee.
All right, is there a consensus as to the favorite food? Baked ham, deviled eggs, key lime pie. What, what, else, is, what else is good Easter food? Hi, beloveds. Grab a seat if you would this morning. Welcome to KC. Easter Sunday, uh, I want you to have one of these. This is a, a sermon note, a little um, fill-in-the-blank note guide. I know two weeks in a row of doing this. Who's impressed? These are in, these are in your seats. Oh, in yeah, they should be in the seats already with the, um, the colorful flyer. If you don't have one of these, there um, are extras right here, and Sasha will bring you on, and there are pens here as well. If anybody wants a pen, you can keep the pen, too. I'm keeping that one. I want to give this to you for those of you that love filling the blanks. Last week, I gave you one with the blanks filled in. This week, they're not filled in. So all you, like, people that love to write it in yourself, this is your week. I'm, I'm trying to share the love around. This is, a, this is a message, why the resurrection matters. Last week, we looked at why the cross matters. We unpacked um, some biblical reasons for why the cross makes a difference, why it's needed, why the death of the Savior is essential. It's the place where God's holiness and God's love come together. Now, this morning, my favorite thing to talk about, why, why the resurrection matters, four reasons that motivate us. I want to begin, though, by reading from 1 Corinthians 15. If you have your Bibles, we will be in that chapter, but we will also be in a number of other places, as you can see on your sheet here. The scripture will be up here as well on the screen. If you want a Bible to follow along with and you don't have one, there are um, some of those on the communion table right here um, to your left on that little small table there. But let's read this together if we can. 1 Corinthians 15. I want to read um, well, I'm going to read a lot of it, so bear with me. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, not yet I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. All right. Um, why the res resurrection matters. Um, a number of years ago, um, I was, when I was in graduate school, um, I lived nearby to a college called Millsaps College. I think it's an historically Methodist school. And I remember a friend of mine was going to be on a panel, sort of an apologetics and a Christian uh, panel there at this illustrious institution. He and um, a well-known apologist named William Lane Craig was going to be on the panel, as well as some other students talking about... Um, talking about things of the Christian faith, and I believe William Lane Craig made some comment about the historical truthfulness of the resurrection, and a student who was asking a particular question stopped for a minute, and he says, well, hold on, wait, what do you mean the historical, the, the historical sort of validity of, of the resurrection? And Craig said, well, we believe that Jesus literally rose from the dead. Have you ever considered that? And the student said this. He says, you know, I guess I've, I've never really thought about it. I've never really thought if it really actually happened. And then more recently, a few years ago, uh, I had, we had some work done in our home, and there was a young man named Cody who was doing some work. He and his team were there working in the basement. And I had been cooking up some, something for our family for lunch, and I told Cody and his other two coworkers, come on up to the deck, have a hamburger, take a break. And we're sitting and having a hamburger out there, and we're talking about things. He asked what I do. I tell him, well, one of the things I do is I'm a pastor. And he kind of snorts, and he says, well, man, I haven't been in a church. He said, I've probably been in a church two times in my whole life. <laughs> you know, and I, I love having these conversations with people that aren't, aren't in church. I'm just fascinated by what their story is. I said, well, man, you know, Tell, tell me what's going on. Tell me what's your story. And he told me a little bit about it. And, uh, you know, I asked him some of the things that he believes. And one of the things I said was, do you, Cody, do you, you know, I know you believe in Jesus. You believe he was a good person. I said, do you believe, though, in the resurrection of Jesus? And he stopped for a minute. He kind of looked at me, you know, and we had enough of a conversation. He didn't want to just say something um, flippant. He says, you know what? I'm going to take a chance and I'm going to say yes. I was like, Cody, that's a, that's a good idea, buddy. Good idea, take a chance and say yes. So as Christians, we're taking a chance and we're saying yes to something that sounds impossible to believe, to Western sort of enlightened thinking. We know it may not make sense, although as it so happens, the resurrection of Jesus is one of the most verifiable events in ancient history eyewitness accounts, extra biblical accounts, all kind of things that verify the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus. We're not going to get into that today. There's a lot of stuff out there that you can look at. I want to give you, though, four reasons that motivate us, four reasons that motivate us to, to move forward in believing this, why the resurrection matters. Number one is this. The resurrection matters because it proves Jesus' power and authority. It proves Jesus' power and authority. On the cross, we see God's love. We talked about this last week. On the cross, we see the radical love of God poured out for you and for me. He didn't have to do that, but he chose to do it because of his love for us. On the empty tomb, however, we see God's power. We see his power as he overcomes death. So the cross is humiliation. The empty grave is incredible victory. John eleven twenty five. 25, this will be up here. In John chapter 11, by the way, Jesus is at the, uh, the, 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 um, he's at his, a friend's house, Lazarus and Mary and Martha, his sisters. Lazarus has been sick. You know the story. Lazarus has recently died. They sent word to Jesus, please come. You can help him. Jesus doesn't show up until Lazarus is already dead. The sisters are obviously grieving and weeping. And, he, and, and Jesus is going to come and say something to her that's very provocative. He says this in John eleven twenty five. 25. He tells her, I am the resurrection of the life. First of all, the sister Martha says, yes, I know that my brother in the end will one day be raised up. And Jesus looks at her and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Anyone who believes in me, 
who lives in me and believes in me will never die. So it's a gutsy claim, but it's going to prove Jesus' power and authority because in a few days, he himself will be dead. He himself will be uh, in, in, in the tomb, just like his friend Lazarus. In a few days, he himself will be crucified, dead, and buried in inside of the tomb. And the Spirit of God's going to raise him up from the dead. And it's going to come back to prove his, his power and authority in these words here. And if Jesus, if Jesus raised from the dead, he must be who he says he is. That's one thing that we believe. All, think of all the things that Jesus said about you and I and about the Father and about the world around us. Make all these claims. I am the resurrection and the life. I am living water. I am the good shepherd. No one comes to the Father except through me. All these things. He has the power to forgive. All of those claims really don't mean a lot unless he has the authority to back them up and the power to back them up. So all the way up into his life, we're like, yeah, Jesus, you're saying good stuff, but man, can we really believe what you say? How do we really know that you are the resurrection and the life? How do we really know that you have, you can do this and you can do this? Sure, you do miracles, but you know what? A lot of people can kind of do cool signs and wonders and tricks. But it's not until we see the empty grave that we realize that he really did have the authority to, to, to make the claims that he did. And so his, why his resurrection matters is now we can look backwards at the rest of his life and say, yep, that's got to be true. Yep, that's got to be true too. Yep, that's got to be true. Every single word that Jesus says is true. Why? Because he proves it in an empty cro- at the empty tomb. He goes with me on this. He didn't just die and like, oh, no, 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 no. It's like, holy cow, this guy is like, nothing can stop him. Nothing can stand in his way. And so it proves his power and authority. The resurrection matters because it proves that he has power and authority. Power, first of all, to declare you and I forgiven, free children of God. Jesus declares that, that we can be forgiven and free sons and daughters of God. How does he have the authority to do that? Because he was crucified and he rose again. He's got the power to he's got the power to break a cycle of sin and shame and addiction in my life and in your life. He's done it in my life. Anybody else? Breaking a power, breaking a cycle of addiction and shame and sin? How does he have the authority to do that? Because of the empty the empty tomb. He's got the power to free you from past mistakes. He's got the power to bring you into radical overflowing life. So that's the first reason that motivates us. It proves Jesus' power and authority. I want to believe somebody who can back it up. And it's one thing to see his love. That's beautiful. A lot of people die for the, for the things that they believe. You know what? A lot of people have been martyred for the things that they, a lot of people are inspiring because of the things that they believe. But how many have said, you know what? I'm coming back to life. I want to flip this thing inside out. He's not just inspiring us. He has the power and the authority to do what he, what, he, what, he, what, he, what he promises to do. That's the first thing. The second one is this. Why the resurrection matters. It means, the resurrection means there is a living and reigning Christ. You ever notice that we say this in church? Jesus Christ is risen. English teachers, what tense is that? That's a present perfect tense, isn't it? Am I right on that? Present perfect? That means it is a present thing that still has ongoing implications into the future. We don't say that Christ was raised to life, and we do, you know, we do say that, but really what we mean is he is, that is an active reality here and now. So think about what this means. Well, let me read a little bit to you. Um, Romans 8.34 says this, Jesus Christ who died... More than that, who was raised to life, so death and resurrection, is, present tense, at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So think of all the people that have inspired us, that have lived moral lives, that have died for what they believe. Think of Gandhi, think of, think of uh, JFK, think of Martin Luther King, think of any other religious leader who is inspiring to us who lived a religious life. We would not ever dare say that Martin Luther King is still alive ministering for civil rights. We wouldn't say that. You can go and you can see his tomb. You can go and you can visit his tomb. You can talk to his, his family. But we make the claim, the Bible makes the claim, that there is no body... No corpse of Jesus anywhere on the earth. 
There is no physical remains of Jesus anywhere on the earth. He is active and present somewhere in or out of time and space. So he was raised like, he's at the right. He was not just an inspiring memory, but the active presence. Listen to this. He is still in the flesh. All right. So I, I can't explain this. But Jesus didn't shed off of his humanity when he came up out of the grave. When he took on your humanity and my humanity, he keeps it on forever. He is incarnate forever. That means when he ascended into heaven, his body is somewhere. Who knows where it is? No idea. That's right. That's right in the Father. Where's that? I don't know. You know, physically, we see him as this is a different message, ascension. Physically, we see him ascend up. That doesn't mean that he's in the stratosphere. It's almost like the ascension was kind of like God's way of saying he's kind of above your world now. Right? Doesn't mean that he's in orbit, but he is somewhere with a physical body and he's interceding at the, at, the, at the right hand of the God of the Father. There is a living and reigning Christ. Right now, there is a living and reigning Christ. Hebrews 4, 14. Since then, I love this. Since then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, who is that? Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. All right. 22nd Greek lesson, understands. That word is sympathize. It's where we get our English word sympathize. We so throw that around, that word all the time around. Like, oh, I sympathize with you. We don't really mean that at all. It just means like, whatever, I'm, just, I'm trying to make you feel better. Can you sympathize? No, 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 no. What this really means, sympathize means to suffer with. Sim, it's our, it's our word sim, and then pathos is suffering. To suffer with someone. Jesus is suffering with us. He understands our weaknesses right now at the hand of the Father. Jesus knows what you're going through. Hear me on this. You feel rejected. You feel misunderstood. You feel alone. You feel tired. You feel overlooked. You feel tempted. Jesus has faced every single one of those things. He knows what you're going through. Still enfleshed. He's active in ministry right now. Jesus is active in ministry right now. Meg and I, in some of our work, we get to have conversations with people in the missions field, people that are working, especially in Muslim countries and Muslim nations. And we're hearing this. You've heard this again and again about how many, many Muslims are coming to Christ. You know, the fastest growing church in the world is what? Iran. Did you know that? The fastest growing church in the world right now is Iran predominantly Muslim nation where Christianity is outlawed. Why? Is it because we got these amazing big mega churches, you know, with our programs? No. The underground churches at work spreading the gospel, but in supernatural ways, Jesus is showing up in dreams to the Muslim people. Time and time again, people are saying, how did you come to the Lord? And he says, you know, the man in white came in a dream to me. I've heard it so many times from so many places. Missiologists are saying something is happening in the Muslim world. Jesus is appearing to people in dreams. The man in white is coming to them. He is active in ministry right now all around the world. And guess what? He's active in ministry right here in this city too. He's doing it all around the world. He's doing it right here. He's revealing himself to many, many people right here in Lexington. So why does this matter? If Christ are in his kingdom, if Christ and his kingdom are active and on the move, that changes stuff for me. He's not just an ancient, aspiring figure. The, oh, man, he really inspires me to live a better life. No, 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 no. He is here and now present and doing things in power. That changes things for me. We don't have that if there is no resurrection. We don't have an active and reigning Christ if there is no resurrection. We have a memory, and that's it. Third reason that motivates us, it reverses the curse of death in the world. Why the resurrection matters. It reverses the curse of death in the world. You know, I studied science some, a little bit, 
uh, in, in, in college, almost majored in it, something called the second law of thermodynamics. Anybody know what that means? Law of entropy is a pretty complicated thing, but basically it means that everything tends towards chaos. Am I right? Am I right, doctor? Is that kind of what that means? Things tend towards chaos. If you don't believe it, come to my yard in about two months. <laughs> Look at my grass and my fence in about two months. I, you cannot leave things alone because they disintegrate. You cannot leave a house untouched for a century because it will disintegrate. You cannot leave a human body un, un sort of alone. It will disintegrate. That's the second law of thermodynamics. There's a curse of death in the world. You don't have to, I, don't, I don't have to prove this to you. Look around. There is a downward spiral of, de of disintegration. There's sickness in the world. There's sadness in the world. There's natural disaster in the world right now. There's war, there's famine, there's corruption, there's greed, there's addiction, there's hopelessness, there's divorce, there's abuse. Anybody want to say, I don't believe you? <laughs> that is the spiral, that is the, the, the curse of death in the world. We have made a mess of the world. And we can put lipstick on the pig, but we still have to admit, yeah, we've made a mess of the world that we're in. But the cross and the empty grave have shifted something. In about eight days, something is going to be happening sort of in the, in the heavens, right? This aligning of the planets where the sun is here and, is that right? The sun is here and the moon is here and the earth is here. Is that right, guys? Is that what a solar eclipse is? Okay. And on Monday, next a week from tomorrow, there will be a great solar eclipse. It's going to be passing right by. Get your little glass. You can go watch it. Craziest thing is going to happen. You know, and, and we know what to expect. And, ne and imagine never seeing an eclipse, though, before. Imagine never knowing what's happening. And all you see is that your source of light is beginning to wane. It's beginning to be clouded over. And with each passing moment, the sun gets darker and darker and darker. This is what's happening in the spiritual realm. There is, a, there is a, 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 a darkening of the world as sin is increasing, as hopelessness is increasing. But in the cross and the grave, guess what happens? Guess what happens? All of a sudden, the light begins to break out. You begin to see light again. When Jesus goes into the grave, something shifts. And there is an, a reversal of the cycle of sin and death. Now, is that reversal instantaneous? Y'all say no. Anybody still been sick this week? Anybody still have hopelessness and fear? Anybody bury a loved one in the last year? Yeah. The cycle is not totally, it, it's reversed, but it's still present until Jesus comes back. But look at what he says, Revelation 1.18. I am the living one, he says. I died but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I love this one. I hold the keys of death and the grave. Isn't that awesome? Sometimes when we're like getting ready to go somewhere as a family, like we're all getting ready and Josie, wherever you are, she's like so eager to go. She's like, she'll grab the keys to the car and go out there and wait for us. And I'm like frantically looking around because I can't find the keys. And Josie's like, I got the keys here. I can't do anything without the keys. I can't go anywhere without the keys. She's got them. She has the full control and the full power to do whatever she wants to do. Lord forbid. <laughs> Jesus has stolen the keys that give power to death and hell in the grave. He has stolen them back from the enemy. And he says, look, I've got it here. Look right here. He says this, I'm alive. I was dead. I was dead. Now I'm alive. I hold the keys of death and the grave. Uh, Hebrews 2, 14, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Something happened, you guys, something happened, something happened that shifted, that not, it shifted history, it shifted reality, it shifted all of just everything. It wasn't just one man coming back to life. It broke something. It was, like, it was like the DNA of the world sort of had this like mutation in it for the better. 
and death started to be undone. We see the craziest thing in the end of Matthew's gospel. We, the, other, the craziest thing happens in the end of Matthew's gospel. Not only does Jesus come back from the dead, a whole bunch of other people are resurrected at the same time. Isn't that wild? Like the rock, the whole earth is just like convulsing and giving up its dead at the, at the, at the, at the burial of Jesus. Like all this, like these people just come back to life and they're walking around in Jerusalem. What in the world? Because one man's death changes everything, you guys. It changes the curse of sin and death in your own life. It brings life back to you. So it reverses the curse of sin and death. If the, if the resurrection really happened, it means that death and brokenness in my life are somehow being reversed. Fourth one is this. Fourth reason that motivates us. It means a new life is possible for you. A new life is possible for you. Beloved, his empty grave means that your grave can be empty as well. Jesus is in the business of robbing graves. He's the original grave robber. Bill Johnson says that Jesus ruins every funeral he attends, including his own. <laughs> and some of us have, have a grave of hopelessness and despair. We are stuck, some of us, Maybe not in this room, but certainly in our extended community. A grave of hopelessness and despair. I wake up every day and I feel hopeless and I can't get out of it. Jesus wants to rob that grave though. And some of us have been in a grave of unfulfillment. Some of us have had it all. I've had a lot of money. I've had a lot of things. I've had a lot of possessions. I've had a lot of pleasure. Spend my life doing that. But every time I still feel unfulfilled. Why? Why can this next relationship not fulfill me? Why can this next purchase not fulfill me? Why does this new job not fulfill me? Why does this pursuit of ambition not fulfill me? And it's a grave of unfulfillment that we can't shake ourselves out of. Anybody been there? Y'all, I know what that's like. Some of us have been in a grave of, of addiction and enslavement to sin. Something that you said yes to a long time ago now has its claws in you and you can't get out and you want to be free of it. But you're bound up like Lazarus is bound up in the grave. And that's the truth of the gospel is all of us are in need of death and resurrection. Easily, easily needed to die and to be raised up. I didn't need to be a better person. That's not what I needed. I needed to die and start over again. I didn't need self-improvement. Jesus didn't want to better me. He wanted to deader me. And I needed to be deader so that he could raise me back up in the way that he desired me to be. All of us need this great do-over, fresh start, new life. Romans 6, verse 4. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Beloveds, it can't be any simpler than that. Verse 5, since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are no longer slaves to, you don't have to be a slave to sin. You don't have to be stuck in that grave. There's power in the cross and there's power in the grave for you. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know that we will also live with him. 
We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin, but now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. So the good news is this. The gospel, by the way, beloveds, the gospel is not just about forgiveness. The gospel is not just about wipe the slate clean and start over again. That's not what you and I need. Is there forgiveness? Of course there is. All the stuff that I've done has been free. That's, that's not the fullness of the gospel. It's about a brand new life of purpose, of freedom, of hope, an unshakable joy here and now. If someone has convinced you otherwise that the gospel is simply a matter of praying a prayer so you can go to heaven, they have misrepresented biblical reality. The gospel is a great exchange. Your dead life for his brand new life inside of you. And there's no, let me tell you, beloveds, there's no comparison. Chuck, there's no comparison, is there? (laughs) Empty rags for the treasures of the kingdom? Are you kidding me? All right, musicians, come on up. I want to end this just with an Easter challenge to you this morning. It's on the back. This is a message for us, and it's a message for our community. It's a message for the world. If you've never considered the gospel, if you've never considered the cross and the empty grave, Right there. there go. All right. If you've never considered the cross and the empty grave, my challenge to you is simply take a chance. Take a chance. Wager on it. Gamble on it. Let's stand together. Musicians, you guys can go ahead and start music. I don't want to manipulate or misrepresent. I just simply want to offer the promise that Jesus offers. 2 Corinthians 5 says, If anyone belongs to Christ, he is made new. Old things have gone, everything is made new. If you belong to Christ, you know what that's like. You may be in a season where you don't feel new. It's okay. Hang in there. Don't quit. If you've, made, if you've said yes to Jesus in the past, but you feel like you've gotten off, it's okay. Hit delete. Get back up. Keep on going. Keep on walking. God's not angry at you. But he wants to walk with you. God's not waiting on you to prove anything. He just wants to be on the journey with you. A journey towards newness of life and wholeness. If you've never said yes to him, I want to give you a challenge and an invitation. Try it. Give it a chance. We're going to worship here. We have a few prayer ministers that are on this far side. I know we've got, we've got some things we've got to do for Easter egg hunt. I'm excited about it, but we want to take some time and just um, and respond. And if we can pray with you, 
about what you've heard or if you've got a prayer need, like, you know what, you got something physical going on, you want some prayer for healing, we practice, we practice healing for prayer every week here. We want to pray for you. If you've got a relational issue, if you've got a financial issue, job, whatever it is, if you just, anything that you want Jesus to come and to help you with, we want to pray with you. That's what we're here for. That's what the body of Christ is here for. And if you've never begun and you want to begun, there's a simple prayer on the bottom of your sheet, how to get started. And come and talk to us and we'll be glad and answer any questions or help walk with you through that. But let's worship together. We're going to worship for a few more moments. Prayer ministers are here. And then we'll give some instructions about what's happening when we wrap up. Father, we love you today. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, for the empty cross and what accomplishes for us. We thank you for new life and peace and hope and joy, Lord, that's unexplainable and unshakable. There's nothing like resurrection life. I thank you, Lord, for it. Would you pour it out today? Pour it out, Lord, across the city today. In Jesus' name, amen.
going back, I'm moving ahead, here to declare to you, my past is over in you, all things are made new, surrendered my life to Christ, I'm moving, not going back, I'm moving ahead, here to declare. Surrendered my life to Christ. I'm moving, not going back. I'm moving ahead, here to declare to you. My past is over in you. All things are made new. Surrendered my life to Christ. I'm moving. When Brad and I met, I was a freshman at Asbury um, College back then, but university, he was a senior, and he had already made it through, um, you know, the most of that harder part of school, and I was just entering in, and, and um, I remember Brad sharing with me in just some conversations, early friendship days, much of what he shared today, his background that he had been taught from his father and his grandfather, and probably his great-grandfather, who had shared, these pastors who had shared this, this story of why the resurrection mattered in their family. And I remember it was so clear to me that this was so different than the word, big word here, the theology that I grew up with. The theology that I grew up with was that I would get up and the world would smack me down. And I had to pull myself back up by my boot strings and just keep doing it again. And the world was gonna smack me down and I could keep going, but the hope of the gospel was that I could keep doing it. And honestly, y'all, I had hit a wall my freshman year of depression. I was like, why? Why do I keep doing these cycles? Then it wasn't like I had, I mean, I was a, a really naive, <laughs> 18 year old girl there wasn't some dark hidden secrets in there but the emotion I did not feel free in Christ I didn't feel free and I remember this young man sharing with me he's like Meg you don't understand grace at all I was like grace what are you talking about and he starts unloading some of these ideas with me and it completely changed I was like wait there's this there's an option for this we can grow we can the holy there's more there's so much more y'all there's so much more. And, and as we come together as a body, and, and we all come from different backgrounds and different theology backgrounds, and we come together in this, in this kind of conglomerate, I think at times it's good to say, no, this is what I believe. I believe without a shadow of a doubt that the Holy Spirit wants to move in, make himself home. Meg needs to die so that he can live a resurrected life that means I do not have to keep going back to the patterns that have held me before in my life. I think it's a big deal. It's a big deal. All right, guys, I'm so excited that y'all spent Easter Sunday with us. Thank you so much for coming. There's a list that you got already about things that are coming up this next week, this next month, all, all this stuff. We are going to be shifting. This is so much fun. I think our kids are going to be brought back in here to do um, Easter eggs. Hey, if you don't have kids here today, it's still good to hang out and watch because kids having fun blesses all ages, right, Miss Betsy back there? It does. I've never seen Miss Pat smiles so much as when she watches the kids have fun in church. So it doesn't matter your age. Feel free. Hug somebody. Meet someone. We're not in a huge hurry to run out of here, but we are in a huge hurry to get the kiddos in here so we can have some fun. Um, Jonathan Lewis and Jessica were hiding eggs and other stuff. I hear there's like stuffed animals. I don't even know. They go all a little crazy on this thing. Um, it's not about the eggs. It's about fun for the kids, and they just, it's wild. I mean, there's giveaways, and there's just different things that are going to go on. It's worth hanging around and watch Miss Danielle's version of crazy happening. So let me just do a prayer and a blessing, a benediction, and we will move on. Lord, I want to take your word and I want to chew on it. I want to eat it. I want to know what your word says but I want to be hungrier for it. So Lord, I pray for myself and my friends here that you would make us hungry for your word, to believe what it says and to do what it says we can do and that you do what you say you do. 
Would you not leave us a, a tired people, anemic for you, Lord? Would you make us brave? We can do hard things, even if that means running to you. We love you, Lord. I pray that people would go from here and share the gospel, share the good news with others that need it in our area. We love you. Amen. Amen. Oh, wait. Kids are coming in here. Any other announcement I'm supposed to do, or do we just play for me? I mean, can we?